Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming this evening. It's certainly a privilege to be here and have the opportunity to present Douglas Rowland's story. Eight years ago, I knew nothing about Rowland. He came to light when I was flicking through the RNA Championship records. I noticed that Jack Simpson had won the championship in 1884 at Presley, and that a D. Rowland had come second. I had a dim recollection of the Simpson brothers, probably to do with Bob Shaw and Carnoustie, but was completely unaware of Roland. So I looked to see how he got on the following year. Nothing. The following year, nothing. And the following year, nothing. And found out that he didn't compete again until 1894, ten years later. <clears throat> I thought there might be a story behind this, but I didn't think it would play such an important part in my life over the last eight years. No one seemed to know much about Douglas. A few knew that he'd been second in the Open Championship twice. Some knew of the distance he could propel a gutty ball. A small number believed he'd gone overseas, probably to the United States, and returned unable to play. And even one or two recalled a rumour that he had to leave Scotland due to an affair of gallantry. But there was no notion that he was anything out of the ordinary. This evening I will set out what I've discovered about Douglas and explain why I think he's the most important golfer of the period 1888 to 1894 and why I think he deserves a place at the top table of 19th century golfers. I'm going to separate the story into three chapters. Firstly, his early years and his rise. Uh, secondly, the peak of his career covering the period 88 to 94. And uh, finally, his fall and demise. He's clearly a handsome, powerful man, described in the golfing annual as the beau ideal of a rugby football forward. He was well over six foot and weighed nearly 14 stone, so for the time that was exceptional. And I think it's clear from the photograph that he would neither have problems hitting a ball a long way nor attracting female attention, and so it's proven. Even his name's interesting. Only one of his siblings had more than one Christian name. And that was Mary Harris Rowland, who was named after her aunt, not surprisingly, Mary Harris, who was James Braid's mother. So Rowland and Braid were cousins. So why did Douglas attract four Christian names? There was an Admiral John Erskine Douglas, who was governor of Jamaica in the early 19th century, but there's no possible link to Fife or to the Rowland family. There was a local landowner called Erskine, and sometimes children were named after local gentry in the hope of some preferment later in life, but it still doesn't explain the four names, but there you are. The small village of Earlsfoy certainly produced a plethora of golfing talent. This included players such as James Braid, the Simpson brothers, of whom there were five, but Jack, Archie and Bob were, were the key. Uh, Roland himself, and Ralph Smith, but there's approximately 20 others who made their living directly out of golf over this period. And there's club makers, Andrew Scott, George Forrester, and James Crowley, so well described by Ronnie Sinclair in his work. Just to give you an idea of the quality of the club makers, Scott was club maker to Edward VII and George V. The interesting thing is that the population of Errols Ferry in the 1881 census was 286, and yet we had this real diaspora of talent based in the village. Rollins and Simpsons lived only a few yards apart, and the boys became good friends. And Roland left school to train as a mason at the age of 13. He played his golf Earl's Ferry Thistle and won the Borough Medal five times, as well as a number of other local events, but it's late in 1883 that he starts to be noticed outside of Fife. John Ball was an up-and-coming amateur and recognised as one of, the, one of the, uh, the key amateurs in English golf at this time, and Ball issued a challenge to any amateur to play him home and away, each choosing a preferred course. Douglas took up the challenge and not surprisingly elected to play Errol's Ferry and again equally unsurprisingly Ball chose Hoylake. 
double, doublest savage ball at Errol's Ferry, winning the first leg nine up. And the interesting thing is that Ralph Smith swore to H.G. Hutchison that he, in fact he was a living to the good, but every other record at the time suggests it was nine, which certainly seems sufficient. There was no significant money in offer for the players, but it's reasonable to assume that a significant amount of betting had taken place and Ball's backers would have hoped for a better return in the second leg, which was to be played the following week at Hoylake. After the first round at Hoylake, Ball was one up and his backers were looking hopeful. However, Roland then hit form and he won the Hoylake leg 4 and 2, a crushing 11 and 10 victory overall. <coughs> this was a victory over someone who, with good reason, had considered themselves one of the best in the land. It's a good way to announce your presence to a wider golfing audience. Now Jack Simpson and Tom Morris had travelled south with Roland for the match in the world, and Jack and Douglas then celebrated in what they referred to themselves as a right royal manner, well into the early hours. So much so that Roland lost his clubs in one pub they were in. <laughs> Eventually getting back to their room, they found a note from Robert Chambers, who'd organised the matches, stating that another match uh, between Ball and, Ro Ball and Roland had been arranged for the following morning and that Roland was to appear promptly. So after a few hours sleep, sleep Douglas was to be found rummaging through the Hoylake locker room in search of a few clubs to borrow. He took to the course the worst for wear and he reached the 13th tee five down. Then in his own words, refreshing breezes from the D began to clean my head of the Liverpool jollification. <laughs> And astonishingly, he won the remaining six holes to win the match. He'd beaten one of the best amateurs in the country three times in eight days. This was the first instance, though, of what was to become a really well-worn story. His golfing excellence vied with what, let's, let's call it, his exuberance of the course, and no one could be quite sure which would prevail in any given day. Almost immediately, <clears throat> he turned up at St Andrews here. So immediately after the RNA Autumn uh, medal in 1884 in the company of Jack Simpson, Douglas made an impression here at the home of golf. I will let H.G. Hutchison take up the story as he actually participated in the match. So he says, he states, immediately after the medal came the message from Ely and Errol's Ferry. Would any pair at St Andrews give a match in the foursomes to a couple of stonemasons? <laughs> Leslie Balfour asked me if I would play with him against them. I knew I was not in good form, and I don't think he was either. But we still said we would play them. They came over and seemed like very nice young fellows indeed. The name of one was Douglas Rowland, and that of the other, Jack Simpson. We'd never heard of them before. We continued to think of them as very nice fellows until the ninth hole, at which point we were two up. The truth is that the Masons had not got their hammers going at all, but we didn't know that. On the way home, we began to doubt whether they were as nice as we thought. <laughs> Roland began hitting the ball to places we'd never seen it hit before, and Simpson so followed up that they were reaching with a drive and an iron, holes that it was, at that date, scarcely decent to approach in this metallic way. They were gutty balls, mind, which did not fly off the irons like rubber cores. They finished that round to the good of us, and in the afternoon they made us look very foolish indeed. <coughs> I do not think that Leslie or I ever got off that uh, over that match until we read the result of the Open Championship played shortly afterwards. It went Jack Simpson first, Douglas Rowland second. After that we could make a better reply when we had to listen to the very pointed inquiries of friends, ask, what sort of golfers are the stonemasons of Ely? Are they any good? <laughs> <laughs> Immediately after that triumph again against Hutchison and Balfour, uh, Jack and Douglas travelled to, to Prestwick. There were 28 people entered, few by modern standards, but above the norm for the, that period. The weather was really poor with a strong gale blowing, which was, according to the Field magazine, baffling to the players. Douglas and Jack had travelled down from Fife, and possibly with the remnants of some winnings from their exploit at Hoylake, they'd rented a house. 
The two had a merry evening on the eve of the championship, and Roland, after a few more drinks, finished the night off by drawing a circle in the centre of the floor and announcing that the championship medal must be placed there the following evening. Roland played well and finished with a credible score of 164. He dealt well with the conditions and one of his drives was measured at 240 yards. However, Jack had played even better and won with a score of 160. But the championship medal was indeed ceremoniously placed in a circle. And even though he didn't win, it's clear that Douglas was improving. The Glasgow Herald reported that Douglas received three pounds for his efforts, and this sum, added to earlier prize money he'd won in Earl's Ferry, would play a key part in events that would unfold the committee rooms of Royal Liverpool later that year. In the RNA records for the 1884 championship, he's listed as Mr. D. Rowland from Leith, which is also important when we go on to the next section. <clears throat> so one of the rumours is round about the affair of gallantry. So the rumours that were around at the time was that he had seduced the lady and this case was uh, pursued at the Sheriff Court. <clears throat> Secondly was that the case had been brought at Cooper Sheriff Court. The third tier of this was that the lady involved was actually the daughter of the Sheriff of uh, Cooper, <coughs> which would have been problematic indeed. Uh, and that as a consequence of this, Roland had to leave Scotland immediately, never to return. The, um, the explanation in The Colossus of Golf by David Malcolm and Peter Crabtree uses much more modern language. Um, I, and it, I, again, I quote, Roland feared to, failed to appear at Cooper Sheriff Court to face a paternity suit. Sadly, with a charge of contempt of court hanging over him, the golfing press reported that he was not able to return to Scotland and was therefore unable to contest the Open until it was played in England. <coughs> Our examination of the records held at Cooper Sheriff Court didn't yield any further information for me, and neither did a more general hunt across all Sheriff Courts in Scotland. I was at a complete dead end until Richard Williams, who's the Honorary Secretary of the British Golf Collectors Society, suggested that I look out for someone called Louisa Campbell. I discovered the case, not at the Sheriff Court, but actually at the Court of Session in Edinburgh, bought by a Louisa Campbell against Douglas Rowland in 1884. Rowland had met Louisa Campbell in 1880, while she was in service in Edinburgh, and had professed his great love and admiration for her. Louisa reciprocated this professed love and became deeply and affectionately attached to Douglas. Douglas proposed that they should marry as soon as possible, and Louisa agreed to this proposal and accepted Douglas as a promised husband. These are words out of the court case, which is why they might sound a bit old-fashioned, but rather than paraphrase them, uh, this, is, this is actually what's in the condescendence of the case. They agreed they should marriage round about which Sunday, 1884, and letters between them that followed regularly repeated this date as the latest that they would, mar that they would marry. Louisa fell pregnant, and when she confided in Douglas and told her not to worry that they would be married as promised, Douglas continued to visit her until the end of January, 1884, when his visits suddenly stopped. He'd left Edinburgh and returned to Earl's Ferry. Whatever his reasons, this is certainly far from gallant. Louisa had a daughter on the 3rd of August 1884, and she was christened Louisa Roland Campbell. The Court of Session, a few months later, concluded in the consequences of the seduction, the breach of promise and general conduct of the defender towards the pursuer, the defender being Roland, the pursuer being Campbell. The pursuer has suffered greatly in her health, and her character and her prospects in life have been seriously injured by the actions of the defender, and the, pursuers, the pursuer has therefore suffered great loss and damage. The sums sued for in the circumstances are therefore very moderate. This is um, an interesting adjunct to that because it's part of the case that, the, uh, that Louisa Campbell's lawyer put together it includes this sentence here, 
which is the defender is an expert golf player, and in this game, he makes large sums of money. He takes part in golf matches all over the country, both in England and Scotland. And I think that had a significance <coughs> and an impact on the amount that, uh, that Roland was um, found to be able to give uh, Louisa Campbell in, in reparations. Sorry. The bailiff sent a letter to his parents' home in Earl's Ferry, but Douglas, not surprisingly, was playing golf, in this instance, again, against the ball at Hoylake. And the assumption has always been that they stayed there. But he didn't. He returned to Scotland. And not only did he return, he stayed in Scotland for around about five months. Uh, he came home in October and almost settled, stayed with his sister in Leith, hence the earlier reference that triggered my attention when he was <coughs> in the 84 Open, saying that he was Mr. D. Rowland of Leith. He played at Leith Links on the 1st of January 1885. Didn't win the competition, but he was, he was mentioned as a pri one of the prize winners. And he also won a competition at Earl's Ferry Thistle on the 14th of February 1885. So he was certainly still in Scotland around these days. It's absolutely impossible to determine whether he complied with any or, all, any or all of the findings from the court and whether he paid any of the monies due to Louisa. <coughs> but his next move back down to Liverpool in early 1885 to take up a job working on the Mersey Rail Tunnel as a mason could be construed as him taking a job with a regular income in order that he could make the reparations to Louisa Campbell and her daughter. Certainly, it's far from certain, it's speculation, but it is a possibility. And he didn't play golf. There's no record of him playing any matches during the period that he worked as Mason. So there's some, something that caused him to take a regular job. And it's supposition from me that he may have been trying to pay some of the, some of the reparations due. So Douglas had a daughter, Louisa Roland Campbell, who had a daughter called Georgina Campbell, who in turn had a daughter. And I'm delighted to welcome Douglas Rowland's great-granddaughter here this evening, ladies and gentlemen, Mrs. Louisa Oliver. <laughs> I got a wonderful note from Louisa uh, when we first made contact. And in it she says, my interest in Douglas Rowland is to try to ascertain if he was my grandmother's father. My grandmother's birth certificate says she was illegitimate, but the belief long held here was that her father was James Braid, who was 13 and living in Earlsbury, but nonetheless. Then some doubt was thrown onto this and thoughts turned to Douglas Rowland. By the time that we discovered all of this, my mother was about 96. And when we asked her if she recalled as a child, she used to be taken to Errol's Ferry in Ely to visit her granny, Roland. She said she had no idea that the, this might have been a real granny and just thought it was some old lady they called granny. But I just think that's absolutely fascinating. Thank you for that. <laughs> So after this, Roland uh, had the, the, the amateur championship, as, as we know, started in 1885. And the announcement <coughs> of the new event was carried in the Field magazine and stated that it was to be held at the spring meeting of the Royal Liverpool Golf Club and is open to all amateur golfers, members of recognised clubs. Roland forwarded his application which gave the committee at Hoyt Lake a real problem of defining exactly what was meant by an amateur. The captain, Mr. Cullen, pressed that the tournament be restricted to the members of the invited clubs. And Hoyt Lake seemed to think that that meant it was the 24 clubs who had actually um, given money to, 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 to uh, support the, um, the amateur championship and indeed to sponsor the trophy. That's not clear. The organising committee took a different approach though, one that I think attempted to blur the social standing of a player by relying on the definition, on a definition based on whether someone had earned money. So 
what Thomas Porter, the secretary, came up with was to exclude any player who's accepted a money prize in a competition open to all comers. <coughs> now, we know that prizes in amateur golf were significant, but normally they weren't money prizes, they were effectively vouchers. There is the records of people getting shotguns and silver plates and all sort of things as a prize, but it wasn't money. So the money prize is a very important component there, as is a competition open to all comers. At the same time, if it's many years since a player has done that, there seems no reason why he should not, by the lapse of time, be held to have regained his status as an amateur. This ruling was very specifically drafted to disbar Rowland, but to allow John Ball to play. Both had won money in, uh, in open, open competitions, um, but they had carefully crafted this to have the local hero play, and Douglas disbarred. Ball had won money at an early age, uh, and the committee carefully drafted the rules so that the money won when he was under the age of 16 were disregarded. Ball had also won valuable prizes in amateur competitions, but they were excluded too as the competitions were neither open to all comers nor were money prizes awarded. Roland made the point at the time that although he won prize money, he was making his living as a stonemason and not as a professional golfer. But the committee had shaped the entry conditions to produce the field that they wanted. H.G. Hutchison resigned from the committee in protest. After finishing work on the Mersey Rail Tunnel, an opportunity to return to golf presented itself at the Worcestershire Golf Club at Malvern. He accepted the, the role at Malvern on the condition that he was joined by his wife and sister who would help in the clubhouse. You may have already picked up, there was a bit of a nuance here. He wasn't married and I've traced the whereabouts of his five sisters. None were in Malvern. Uh, Douglas had reverted to type. This may have become known to some at Malvern, but one of the local caddies uh, wrote, DR is a man in pitch in one of the greens. He made a very positive impact at Malvern and soon was taken on permanently, it being the norm that someone was tried out for a three or four month period before being offered a longer contract. He also oversaw the extension of the course from 12 to 18 holes, and the condition of the course was, it was favourably commented on regularly. He played well too, scoring 71 for the new layout, a score which stood for many years. But at least as importantly, it was at Malvern that he met Harry Colt, who would later play a significant role in his life. During this time, Roland began to initiate matches with other professionals, and between 1888 and 1890, I found him playing in a dozen matches, winning 11. He also won all three stroke play events or tournaments that he entered during this period. I think it would be fair to say that the concept of a professional golf tournament was born at St George's in 1888. This event drew a strong field of 32 professionals, attracted by two competitions, one match play and one stroke play. Again, Hutchison, who seems to have been everywhere during this period, he's reported as saying that he thought that this was as representative a gathering of professional talent as has ever been seen in the whole of golfing history. The only conspicuous absentee was the Open champion Jack Burns, who remained steadfastly in St Andrews. However, just in case you thought that he was the one that got away, Douglas did play Jack Burns the following year and won 8 and 7. The match play event was the centre of attraction at Sandhurst, and Roland made his way to the final where he played his close friend and neighbour Archie Simpson and lost after an extra hole. Roller then went on to dominate the stroke play event and won by four shots from Willie Park Jr. and eight from Archie Simpson. A similar model was, fought, was uh, followed the following year in June at Royal North Devon. Again, a strong field. Roland beat Peter Paxton, John Kay, Ben Sears, Archie Simpson and David Brown to win first prize. And he also took the stroke play 
prize too with rounds of 83 and 85. In 1891, Hutchison said, uh, when talking about uh, the Worcestershire Golf Club, that this club had a professional for the past four years, Douglas Rowland, who members of the club are not alone in thinking the finest golfer of his day. This, I think, is the earliest claim that, golfer was, uh, that Douglas was one of the best players in the world. He moved on to Limpsfield Church uh, Golf Club near Seven Oaks in, in Surrey. Now, Limpsfield Church was and remains a charming and challenging nine-hole course, but it wasn't really regarded as a prime role. And in fact, in 1891, just after he'd moved, the census finds Douglas boarding above a pork butcher shop in Limpsfield with his wife Emma, aged 21, from Leeds. Now, it's possible that Emma was one of the women who'd worked at the clubhouse in Malvern, but it certainly, certainly can't be proven. Uh, what's this? What can be assumed, though, from this and other things, is that Rowland's desire for female company remained undiminished. His new position at Limpsfield Charter did provide him with the opportunity to improve his own game and to participate in the growing number of money matches. He was the mainstay of this growing number of exhibition matches in the south of England during the 1890s. His prolific distance was well known to the rapidly expanding numbers of devotees to the game down south, and they attended his matches in large numbers. This in turn attracted money backers to him and his matches. His playing record in 1891 to 93 was again exceptional. Rowland completed, competed in two stroke play events in seven matches, winning both stroke play events and six in seven matches. The quality of Rowland's play is probably best demonstrated by the 100 he scored at Royal Blackheath, which may not sound like much, but that was over 21 holes. And he did that in September 1892. This record was eventually beaten by J.H. Taylor 15 years later and using the new Haskell ball when he covered the 21 holes and 99 shots. I think that gives a fairly accurate representation of how good Douglas was. In 1893, I found Rowland playing six matches, winning four, and a match against Hugh Cody at Blackheath is especially interesting since it was photographed. Most of the photographs still survive thanks to the diligent work of the archivists at Blackheath. And this is one which I think is a remarkable photograph for the, the, fact, the fact that it's 130 years old. Expert. However, the distance he was carrying it demonstrated that whatever it was, it worked. The driving statistics from the match were recorded by Professor Tate and showed that Roland was an average of 15 yards ahead of uh, Kirkcaldy. It was after this that Darwin, Bernard Darwin, credited Roland for largely having started the fashion for exhibition matches. Hugh and Douglas knew one another well sharing a passion for hitting the ball hard and for drinking whiskey. <laughs> These two were really from a different era who saw taking a nip as an integral part of the game <clears throat> and something that added to its enjoyment. Kirkcaldy was known for uh, nipping at the whiskey to help his cough, but Douglas didn't even bother to make an excuse for his <laughs> consumption. Golf magazine reported that Roland had started the nipping process halfway through the match and that that coincided with his best golf. Roland won the match 2 and 1. There's also a foursome in East Lancashire where Douglas and Sandy Heard played Mr. Harold Tilton and Mr. John Ball. It'd be reasonable looking back from the 21st century, I think, to think this would have been a relatively straightforward match for the professionals to win until we realised that Hilton was the reigning Open champion and that Ball was the reigning amateur champion. The interesting thing about this match in particular is there were over a thousand people in attendance and Herd and Roland did indeed win four and three. But this is one of the first times that you could really establish golf as a spectator sport where people were travelling from Manchester to East Banks to, to actually watch people play golf. And Roland was the catalyst for this. Roland's weakness has always been his putting. And I think... Uh, to, to 
When you look with a contemporary eye at this again, you'll see probably why his putting was poor. It seems to be a bit interesting. But if you've ever tried, there's a, there's a very interesting thing about 30 yards away here. You can take a, a wooden-headed putter, which Roland used throughout his career, and any of the two or three gutty balls, and I would, I would defy anyone to get the ball to the home. It's like putting with a ping pong ball. <laughs> um, and if you look at the quality of the greens, it's certainly far from the immaculate surfaces we're used to today. So his putting, but his putting was bad. It was bad even against his contemporaries, let, let alone our view of putting today. In 1894, Roland featured in an astonishing 21 matches and two tournaments. Remember, this was on top of his responsibilities at Lipsfield Chart. He finished second and third in the tournaments. One was the Open Championship and the other one was the St. Port Championship, which followed. And he won 16 of his 21 matches, halfing one. Now, there's something in the loss column that I've always struggled with a bit because he played against someone, R.B. Wilson actually, but gave him six shots and the records show that he lost four and three. But if you give someone six shots, is it fair to count that in, a, in, in the loss column? However, I have, for the percentages here, counted that as a loss. The first and the last games in, in, in uh, 1894 were interesting for uh, a couple of reasons. The first match, three of the four players were from Errol's Ferry, and the last match he played in 1894, all four were from Errol's Ferry. So here we are again with, with a, an idea of just how important the Errol's Ferry impact was on golf, particularly in the south of England during this period. There's a match against Tom Dunn at Tooting Beck in February, which demonstrated that Roland was now drinking to excess. He arrived at Tooting, Tooting Beck in a dishevelled state with no clubs or boots. He borrowed a few clubs, beginning to become a regular event, and a pair of boots from his host. But in the words of Harold Hilton, proceeded to hammer him most unmercifully and lower the course record at the same time. Roland won five and four, outscoring done by nine shots and setting a course record of 74, which included three twos in the back nine. Um, the bit that's less certain, but I particularly like, is that he, he, he gave someone some money for the boots and the clubs and bought a bottle of whiskey and went back in the train home. <laughs> 1894 was a pivotal year for golf. It saw the first championship played outside of Scotland. It saw the first professional uh, winner from England. And it saw the dawn of the great triumvirate's domination of the sport until the First World War. The championship was played at St George's in the second week of June, and the committee, then the committee, driven by Lee Loppers, organised a unique programme for the week. The Open was played on the Monday and Tuesday, St George's Cup, which was an amateur event, was played on Wednesday, and on the Thursday and Friday, <coughs> it was the professionals versus amateur match, which pitted the top eight professionals against the top eight amateurs. For Douglas, this was preceded by a £100 challenge match against Willie Park, which was played on the Saturday before the championship. And it was followed by his participation in the tournament at St. Ports on the following Saturday. And just in case his form dipped due to lack of matches, he accepted a match against Joseph, against Joseph Lloyd of Poe Golf Club, which was to be played at Folkestone on Wednesday. So he had, he had one day off in eight days. Roland initially found it difficult to, to find a backer willing to finance his match with Park. Not due to a concern about whether or not he could win, but because Roland had taken the extraordinary position of requiring 15% of the purse in the event that he won. This was an interesting matter because until then professionals basically had taken what they were given. The backers took the money and would normally give the player something, but nothing guaranteed for winning a match. Roland had changed this by demanding the 15% of the winnings. I think this is a glimpse of the impact that Roland had in the golf overall. Enthusiasts were travelling from London 
he had changed the basis in which matches were, were, were backing and how much a professional would get. And he had established golf as a spectator sport. There were between 1,000 and 1,500 people came down to watch the match against Park. Uh, and it was helped, of course, by the timing just before the Open Championship. But people travelled specifically on a Saturday morning from London and the match was actually delayed slightly to accommodate people travelling. Douglas actually controlled the match and was never behind. He lunged two up, and despite some long putts hold by Park, he extended his lead to win three and two, and he then scored Willie Park by five shots over the day. Next up was the Open Championship, and it starts with another Dougie story. The feeding arrangements then as now were faulty. Roland and one of the Simpsons, he thought Bob, got into the little refreshment tent first. A four pound steak and potatoes were laid out, and the two worthies consumed a lot, <laughs> to the intense annoyance of the caterers who intended to feed the entire field. <laughs> the other pros went hungry. <laughs> Roland finished second in the championship, and was well beaten by J. H. Taylor. We played excellent golf throughout. The following day, he travelled down to Folkestone to play uh, Joe Lloyd. As I've said, Lloyd was a professional at pole, and he'd really been starved of first class opponents, <coughs> and he was a bit of an unknown quantity, and therefore most people expected Roland to win. However, in the day, they were really evenly matched. Both produced some excellent golf. I think both of them round in the, in the afternoon in 75. And uh, this is familiar as well. Roland had a two-footer to square the game and missed it. So he was beaten. Interesting to note, though, that three years later, Lloyd won the US Open at Chicago. So he couldn't have been a bad golfer. Then it was back to St. George's for the professional versus amateur match. And both sides fielded strong teams. I'll just let you cast your eye over the names there. Park Simpson. Kirkcaldy, Octoloni, Taylor Heard, Roland and Fernie. Doesn't sound like a bad side. I mean, a side that probably played better than Scotland last night. But, <laughs> but also the amateur side, although they were robbed by a couple of people, or of a couple of people for the fixture, still uh, managed to field Paul, Tate, Hutchison and Hilton. So again, pretty solid. And this had come from an idea that had been uh, Muted in the in the gold magazine, but why why can't we bring together the best professionals and the best amateurs and see what was going to happen? And uh, they, they they put it together, and the first round pitted one amateur against one professional, and only two amateurs survived to the second round: Ball and Tate. The key match of the tournament was really the semi-final between Lieutenant Tate and Douglas Rowland. And again, Hilton provides the details. He wrote at the time, what a game it was. Roland won the 20th green, and then the run of play deserved to win, and undoubtedly at the best of the long game, and consistently outdrove his opponent. Now, Tate was also known as a long hitter at the time. He, was, he said he wasn't, uh, Tate was not his best from the team. The final was Taylor against Roland, which then of course they'd finished one and two in the championship earlier in the week. And, but uh, Roland this time dominated the early exchanges and was two up early. And then something uncharacteristic happened. Roland started to putt well. And he hold put long putts at the 11th, 12th and 13th to be three to the good with five to play. Taylor got one hold back, but no more. And Douglas had beaten the champion two and one. The St. Port's tournament was won uh, by Sandy Heard, and both uh, Taylor and Roland finished joint third. During the course of the week, over the five events, Roland won £64 and 10 shillings, which is an extraordinary amount of money at the time. And I actually wondered whether or not Roland had considered sending any of this windfall back to Edinburgh to support his daughter, who was by then nine years old and still within the 12-year remit that he was supposed to be paying eight pounds a year towards her upkeep. So what does all this tell us? 
I think it's fair to say that on his day, Roland was unbeatable. His scoring could be exceptional, and he could drive a dirty ball better than anyone ever had. His putting was a weak point, but this didn't stop him overwhelming his contemporaries. I've put together some figures here, which I find quite extraordinary. Between 1888 and 1994, he played in 46 matches that I've found so far, winning 38, which is an 83% win rate in matches. And he played in seven stroke play events, winning five, which is 71%. And the two that he didn't win were in 1884, where he finished second in the championship and third at St. Port's. Peter Lewis began his uh, detailed statistical analysis in 1894 and concluded that Ro he concluded that Roland had the best points average for that year. So after this great week, the members of Limpsfield Chart had prepared to welcome him home as a hero, uh, but Roland had already agreed to move to Rye. Rye had lured Roland from Limpsfield Chart on an offer of 25 shillings a week and the bonus of working with her secretary, Harry Cold. It's more than likely that he had some input into the design and build of the revised course. He's also recorded that year uh, as playing right in 70 shots, which included a seven at the second hole. But it should be noted, this was in a temporary course. I actually shared something uh, of that with him, because I also had a seven at the second hole <laughs> at Rye. So, from 1895 onwards, he was clearly on, the, on a bit of a slide. He'd been at Rye for just over a year, and Roland had taken the unexpected step of resigning from this prestigious club. The minute book reveals that he did so in October 1895, and concludes that he'd given notice to leave because he'd received a very good offer from abroad. This thought may even have been in Roland's mind before being lured to Rye. The Toronto Daily Mail carried an article in February 1895 stating that a letter had just been received by a Mr. Harrison at Winnipeg Golf Club from Willie Park. The news is conveyed that Park, in company with Douglas Rowland, intends leaving Scotland for New York about the middle of March. There was clearly some delay in this, and something had caused uh, Rowland to be left out of the arrangement, because in June, Willie Park, Willie Campbell, Joe Lloyd and Willie Dunn did travel to the US and played a number of very successful matches between one another and against local professionals who were nearly all Scots. However, if this event, if this tour did take place in June without Roland, why did he resign from Rye in October? The answer is always going to be found in Golf Magazine, which reports it's stated that Douglas Rowland is in present in negotiation with an Indian prince to go out to one of the Indian provinces and teach him how to play the game. It's whispered that the retaining fee for the professional services will be £350 per annum. Huge amount of money. Intriguingly, this is followed a few weeks later in golf by an article which states that the Royal and Ancient Game has invaded Travancore and secured a patron and devotee in the Maharaja that appears under the head of expenditure by the Public Works Department a sum for the improvement of His Highness's Golf Club. <laughs> so during the year, I, actually I, I wrote to Travancore and the secretary said yes, that was true about them doing work uh, at that stage on the course and no, they'd never heard anything from Douglas Rowland. So, who knows? I think the point is, though, that three opportunities had slipped through his fingers in 1895. He'd missed out in building what would have been a very promising career at Rye. He missed out on the Willie Park trip to the United States. And he'd missed out on a very well-paid job in India. Rowland's golf was in decline, probably best shown against, by yet another match against J.H. Taylor at Romford, where he was beaten. 13 and 12. In 1898, he married Anna e uh, Emily Edmonds, 
and gave his status as bachelor in Trigi, since he had already been in the census at least three times since having a wife. Um, they had two children together, Mary, who was born in 1899, and Douglas William Andrew Stuart Rowland, following the old tradition, was born in 1901. Over the years, he picked up job, jobs and work at Bexhill and Hastings and St. Leonard's, and he'd also designed a course at Bishop's Stockford. He was a professional at Bexhill for many years, probably from about 1897 to 1908, but his health was deteriorating and he couldn't swing a club, couldn't play, but he could still teach. In 1912, Roland was appointed to his final job, that of professional at the Army Golf Club in Aldershot. <coughs> Bernard Darwin commented in the club history that Roland was too fond of women and drink and was too happy-go-lucky. However, he's an incorrigibly casual and delightful person. He died on the 8th of August 1912 at the age of 53 with his wife Anna with him. And his death certificate lists two causes of death. Cirrhosis of the liver, tubercle of the lungs and larynx hematemesis. The obituaries were fulsome in their praise for him as a golfer. But one in the East of Fife record dared to edge closer to the truth. It said, Roland essentially belonged to the old school, the hard living type which hung in the borderline of the caddy. In dress and manner, he was of the type long superseded by the more prosperous professional we know today. More than one obituary was of the view that he was the best player never to have won the championship. Again, Darwin commented, Douglas Rowland, who was the greatest golfing genius of them all, casual and reckless to a degree, but universally adored, and as regards the long game at least, unrivaled. So what have we got here in total? Because the status of an amateur to be defined as it was, now, someone had to do it, but it was actually Douglas that tested it and brought the, the ruling from the committee at Hoy Lake about how to differentiate between a professional and an amateur, and that stood for many years. I think his, his, his approach to golf and the fact he could hit the ball so well actually attracted people to the game and brought spectators into the game. I think he was certainly the catalyst for money matches or exhibition matches in the south of England. And I think the statistics show that he was the best in the game from 1888 to 1894. So there you have it. John Erskine Douglas Stuart Rowland. A man flawed in many, many ways, but a man who deserves recognition for the golfing genius he undoubtedly was. Thank you.